Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Wednesday night Torah learning and inspiring learning Torah together and sharing through stories. Um, we always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem is going to give to us. So please give generously. So Hashem will and can give us generously. So I'm going to start off with some coins. We're dedicating this class in merit of the complete Rafael Shalema of, of Rafael Chaim Meir Ben Sima Chasha. May he have a complete recovery um, now, okay? If everyone could say amen. We're also going to, um, we're going to, we're dedicating this class in memory of a very, very special person, Sima Karp, a, a dear friend, Sima Bas Mordechai HaKohen, her, in honor of her birthday on that comes out on Shavuos. May her neshama have the highest aliyah. May we see her so soon with the coming of Mashiach. We're dedicating this class in merit of this little boy who's having a procedure tomorrow, a brain, a brain surgery. Levi Ben Rifka Miriam may go well. It's not someone that I personally know, but it's a little boy. And may we all, we're going to learn tonight in his merit. Also in honor of a dear sister, Shlucha, Devorah Leah Bas Yafa Liba. Liba. May she have a complete recovery now, no more suffering and no more pain and only, only relief and revealed blessings. I also want to do this in honor of, we're honoring my neighbor, Razel Bas Hadas, my dear neighbor, Razi Malamid. May she have a complete refua shalema and everyone else that needs all Klal Yisrael. Uh, I do this class weekly in honor of my dear grandmother, Rivka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda. I hope you're proud. Before I introduce you to the, the guest speaker, I'm just going to share with you a real fast thing with about Sima, um, Sima Karp. And I heard this directly from her sister, who she was very uh, nice and she shared this with me, Mrs. Garowitz. And okay, so when her sister was born, um, she was born on Hey Sivan. She was born, the year she was born, it was on, Sh on Shabbos, on Shabbat. And after he was born, her, her father quickly um, ran to tell the family first. And then he went to 770 and he saw the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, this baby is born just in time for Matan Torah. So she was a Matan Torah baby. Her neshama came to this, down to this world in Matan Torah. And she's, re re she's ready to receive this Torah. How appropriate tonight, we're going to be um, sharing about Shavuos and the story about Shavuos, and she's no longer able to be to be here with us today celebrating. So we, we are going to, we are going to honor her memory by learning, and I told her sister this, and she loved this, and her family should be comforted, her children, her husband all her all her relatives and all her dear friends that she had um she she came down ready for matan torah hopefully this hopefully this shavuos she's going to come back with the coming of mashiach that's the plan so we're going to make that happen with hashem's help um later on we're going to bring about this amazing incredible woman and that's the rebbe story of tonight that the Rebbe acknowledged that she, this amazing soul, which she was, came down in time for Matan Torah. And if someone wants to know what's my connection to Sima, her mother and my grandmother, Rivka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda, were best friends. They were real best friends. And now they're up the stairs together, smiling down here because we're honoring their, their, her daughter and, um, my grandmother's like, you know, everyone's watching from upstairs. They see everything that's going on. So um, may her neshama have the highest aliyah. And later on in this program, after the class, we're going to have a farbringen in merit of the complete refuah shalema of Rafal Chaimeir Ben Sima Chasha. And I will um, farbring and the floor will be open for everyone. I would like to introduce to you tonight my um, um, amazing guest speaker who shared with us in the past and we were so very lucky. And I'm also very thankful to her because she never says no to me and always says yes, even though I give her very hard topics to share. Um, but I am very honored to introduce to you guys tonight, 
uh, my dear cousin and friend, Devorah Lea Andrusier, if you can please unmute yourself. And she's also doing this in honor of the complete refuah shalim of Rafael Chaim Mir ben Sima Chasha. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's very nice to be back. Um, I, I do want to excuse the fact that I'm in a bedroom, but we have lots of guests coming for Shavuos and all of the other spaces are occupied. So bed in the background. Um, we are going, I'm going to talk today about the story behind the story. So I think that everyone is familiar with the story of David and Goliath, David and Goliath. Um, it's like an iconic story for the Jewish people. It's in the Tanakh, which is the prophets part of the Chumash and the Torah and the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim. And the, I'll tell you the story of David and Goliath. So Goliath was one of the Philistines. In Hebrew, it's the Plishtim. And this, this whole experience took place, um, Shaul was the king of the Jewish people at the time. And Goliath was one of the giants in the Philistine army. He was said to be 12 feet tall. He was menacing. He was scary. Um, people just had to look at him and they were frightened. They didn't, he didn't even have to do anything to them. And they were immediately frightened. And it says that, um, he would come out for 40 days. Goliath would come out to the Jewish people and he would curse them and threaten them and instill fear in them every morning and every evening for 40 nights. And finally, he said, you know what? Like this, this is nobody can beat me. This is not working. Why don't we do this? Find one person who will be my rival and whoever wins the other side needs to concede, surrender, and that will be the end of it. So who do they look to? They look to the king. They look to the king's army. And all of them literally had like terror instilled in them. And they could not get themselves any of the master army commanders. None of them were able to be the ones to show up. Now, David, David HaMelech, he was not David HaMelech at the time. He was a young boy. And he went out to the fields to bring his brother's food. And when he got there, he saw what was going on every morning, every evening, the cursing, the threatening, the fear that was being instilled. And then he heard this ultimatum that, that uh, Goliath had gave the Jewish people. So he sent a message to Shaul, the king, and he asked if he could be the one to fight Goliath. Now, David was said to be of average height, a very handsome man, but he was a young boy. So when he shows up in front of Goliath, Goliath, he's, Goliath is not happy. He's like, this is who they brought to fight me? Like I could flick you off with my finger. And he starts to proceed to tell um, David all the ways in which he's going to destroy him. He's going to tear his flesh apart. He's going to turn him into a carcass that the vultures will eat, so on and so forth. And, and David, a young small boy, looks to him and he says, you're, sent, you're telling me all these threats. You're trying to instill fear in me. But I stand here on the, on the side with God. I'm not a warrior. I'm not a commander in the army. But I have Hashem on my side. And Hashem is the one who is the master of our army. And all the things that you said you're going to do to me, I am actually going to do to you. Now, David, what does he have with him? He has a shield, a little slingshot, and he picks up five stones from the floor. And as Goliath is about to attack him, he shoots his slingshot and he slams him in the forehead. And that's the end of Goliath. The Plishtim, the Philistines, see that they're the giant, the one who instilled fear in everyone, was taken out by a young Jewish boy. And they realize they're not going to win this. And they surrender. And there's peace, some sort of peace between the Jewish people and Goliath. <clears throat> So now we have to understand, okay? What is the story? We know, and I always say this whenever I speak, that the Torah, anything that we have from Hashem, the Torah is not a history book. Because if it was a history book, we'd be tired and we'd be over it by now. We've read it hundreds of times. What the Torah is, is a blueprint for our lives. So every story that's in the Torah, every story that's in the, in, in the prophets, all of that is there to teach us how to deal with our own lives and our, only day, our own lives on a daily basis today. 
in the year 2023 when these stories happened many, many years ago. So he, he, he wins this thing, they have peace, and now we want to understand who is this man, Gullias? Because like I said, we're sensitive to the nuances. So when they talk about the 40 days and the 40, not the 40 days, and it says that he would come every morning and every evening, specifically at the time that there was, um, specifically at the time that the, he knew that the Jewish people prayed in the morning, we have to say Shema, you're supposed to say Shema in the morning when you go to, when you wake up and you're supposed to say Shema in the evening before you go to sleep. So Gullias, this terrorizing Philistine, knows to come to the Jewish people in the morning, in the evening, specifically when they're supposed to wake up for their times of prayer. Like we don't, that doesn't make any sense to us. Like who, who is this man? So in order for us to understand and know a little bit more about Gullias, we have to go to, which is very much, David, David HaMelech was born on Shavuot. And so this is why um, the stories of David comes up. And we also read Megillat Ruth's on um on Shavuos, and Ruth was David HaMelech's great, great, great grandmother. So who is this guy, Goliath? So let's go back to the story of Ruth. So I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of the story because that's not what this talk is about, but some of you may know it, some of you may not. There was a, um, a very aristocratic, important Jewish man in the community of Beit Lechem. His name was Eli Melech, and he was married to a woman named Naomi. And he was one of the leaders of the community. He had amassed wealth, but there was hunger there, and he decided that he wanted to leave Beit Lechem. His wife, Naomi, did not want to, but her husband said he wanted to, so she agreed to go with him and their two sons, Machlon and Kilion, and they moved to a place called Moab. Now, where does Moab come from? The original Moabite was from Lot. If you remember the story of Avraham and his nephew Lot, that they separated. Lot didn't want to be involved anymore in that world. And he went to live in Sodom. So Lot and his daughter, when they had they were intimate together, they gave birth to the first child, their first child, and his name was Moab. And this is where the descendants come from. So they moved to Moab, and clearly, obviously, there was not a Jewish life there. They left, um, you know, the trajectory of their life in Beis Lechem was one life, and then they moved to Moab, and they left, led, led a, a different style life. There wasn't a Jewish life there. They maintained what they did in their homes. Naomi was a very, her name, Naomi, means pleasant, and she was pleasant and sweet and dedicated and devoted. So they move there and her two sons are said to have been very attractive and very charismatic. And they caught the eye of the king's um, two daughters, King Eglon's two daughters, who was the descendant of Lot. So they, the two daughters decide that they want to marry Machlon and Kilion, Orpa and Rus, two sisters, and they marry these two brothers. Now there are some explanation some some rabbis some commentaries say that the the two Moabite women Orpa and Rus converted and some say that they did not convert all right so they're living together and tragedy befalls the family and Elimelech passes away 10 years later his two sons Mahlon and Kilion also both die so now Naomi is left without her husband and her two sons are gone and she hears that there's food again in Beis Lechem, and she decides that she just wants to go home. So she tells her two daughters-in-law that she's leaving and she's going back to Beis Lechem. And they both start to follow her. They want to go with her. They clearly had a beautiful relationship. The, Naomi was not a mother-in-law, like probably not most mother-in-laws. She understood and respected her daughters-in-law and loved them very much and they loved her in return so they start walking and it says that they walked with her for 40 steps and at that point she stopped them and she said listen I have nothing to offer you I'm going back to base Lechem, a shamed woman we deserted our community when my husband wanted to leave I'm going back we have no money we have no 
power. We have no, we're, we're not important people anymore. Basically, I'm going back in shame. Really, the two of you are free and you should go back to Moab and enjoy your lives as you did before you met my sons. She was, she was a mother-in-law who had foresight. She didn't want to burden her daughters-in-law and she really believed that for them, it would be better if they would go home. So it says that Orpa, they walked the 40 steps and Orpa came up to her mother-in-law and she kissed her and she hugged her. She kissed her, I'm sorry, she did not hug her. She kissed her and she said, I am gonna go. And it was a very sad time for all of them, the mother-in-law, the two daughters-in-law, and Orpa left. Ruth, on the other hand, when it says that Orpa gave Naomi a kiss, when it comes to Ruth, it says that she cleaved to her. She didn't want to leave her. She wanted desperately to be with her. And the words that she said to her are famous, famous words. Just going to read them so I don't miss any out of the part. Um, Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you sleep, I will sleep. Your nation is my nation. Your God is my God. And wherever you die, I will die. So they had absolutely nothing. They came back to Beis Lechem in shame. They were shamed because you can imagine that when they came back, the gossip that went on in that town of Beis Lechem, nothing's different today than it was those all those days back then. Prominent family of the community leaves and goes to Moab. The sons of this prominent family may be married converts, may be married non-Jews, but depending on which opinion. And so you can imagine all the gossip that was going on and how difficult it was for Naomi to come back there. So they come back and they have no money, but in, within Torah law, Hashem allocated certain, created certain rules in order for the poor to be able to eat. So there's different, all different types of rules, leket and all different ones, where when you're harvesting your field and you have, you left one bag at, in the field and you already went home and you forgot it, you have to leave it there for the poor. The corners of your harvest can't be harvested. You have to leave that for the poor, so on and so forth. And that is how Ruth and Naomi were eating and surviving when they first got back. At some point, Ruth enters into the field of Boaz. Boaz was the nephew of her father-in-law, Elimelech. So Boaz was the first cousin of her husband who passed away. And Ruth is a very modest woman. And when she bends down to pick up the, the food that's left in the garden, the wheat or whatever it was, she bends down. She doesn't bend over, but she kneels down. Boaz sees this. Boaz is also a very prominent man in the community, a judge, um, financially very comfortable. And he sees her and he, he admires and respects her. And from then on, purposely, he leaves extra food out for both her and Naomi and make sure that they're taken care of. Naomi hears about all of this. And she says to herself, the mother that she is, forward thinking, I think that Naomi, uh, that Rus should marry Boaz. Um, now she comes up with a very unconventional way for her, for Rus to actually meet Boaz. Um, we're not going to get into that either at the moment, but Rus and Boaz get married. Rus and Boaz have a, a son. Sorry, hold on a second. My, my little hunt decided to come in here. Not usually let in here. So Ruth comes up with an unconventional way for, for Naomi comes up with an unconventional way for Ruth to meet Naomi, uh, Boaz. They get married. They have a son named Yishai. Yishai has a son named, I'm sorry, they have a son named Ovid. Ovid has a son named Yishai and Yishai has a son named David. So here we see how Ruth who was a convert, became the Jewish royal majesty, who was the one who had the zechus, the merit to be the grandmother of David HaMelech and the great, great, great grandmother of Mashiach because it's David, Mashiach ben David. So she had this amazing zechus. 
And we all talk about Ruth and she's the, the Megillah is named for her, but we don't very much talk about Orpa. So in order to understand this whole story, we have to delve into who is Orpa and we need to put ourselves in her shoes if we can for a moment. So who is Orpa? Sorry, let me go back to this for a second. In the explanations, in the, uh, the rabbinical explanations, they say that the 40 steps that they took to accompany um, Naomi to her home, and then Orpah left and Ruth stayed, those 40 days coincide. The reason that it was 40 days is because it's the 40 days that Moshe was with Hashem in Shemayim. So we can hear that explanation and we could say, that sounds really sweet, but like, where do you get 40 days over there, 40 days over here? Like, are we, you know, making explanations to have them fit properly? So let's delve into this more. So who is Arpa? So firstly, her name was Arpa while she was with Naomi. When she leaves Naomi, they say that they changed her name to Harpa with a hey, with an H instead of with an A. So Arpa means the nape of your neck, right here. This is what it means. And after Arpa kissed Naomi, her mother-in-law, she turned her back to her and made a choice to go be in Moab. Um, harpa, what is Harpa means? Harpa means crushed kernel, kernels of grain. And so they describe her like she was crushed kernels of grain, which what does that even mean? So the there's a very difficult thing to share, but it says that the day at the night after Orpa left Rus and Naomi, when she left them, she came back to Moab and it says that she was intimate with 100 men. And it goes into detail. Some It says some came from the back, some came from the front and all kinds of detail. And it's a very shocking thing to hear. We also want to understand if we just read that, we read that explanation, we're like, oh my gosh, what is the Torah trying to tell us? That she was a terrible person? Actually, completely to the opposite. What Arpa was, was a super sensitive woman and... Why did she do this? What came over her that she felt like she needed to do this? So we're going to pause there for a minute, hold that thought. It says then that Hashem in one of these explanations says that the children of the one who kissed, which is Orpa, will be defeated by the, by the woman who cleaved, which is Rus. So Orpa, because she left, because of her, the person who kissed and she left Naomi, her children are going to be defeated by Rus who stayed. So if this is hard to understand because Orpah's kiss was a loving kiss. It was a noble kiss. She loved her mother-in-law. She lived with her. She experienced her for 10 years. So what happens? So let's go back to Rus now. What does Rus do? She goes back with Naomi. Now, she didn't go back with Naomi knowing that one day she was going to be the grandmother of David HaMelech. She went with Naomi knowing that she had a choice. She had the exact same opportunity that Orpah had. Naomi did not make them feel guilt. She had healthy boundaries. And she said to them, I want you to go and enjoy your lives. There's nothing for you to do with me. And yet, Ruth chooses, chooses Naomi. No money, convert or not convert. Um, and she makes her decision. It seems like Ruth is the one who made an irrational decision. Here, her mother in law is offering her to have this beautiful, materialistic life. And she chooses to go into poverty, shame, and everything that she's going to face in Beis Lechem, unknowing about what's coming. And she actively chooses to be with Rus. So what is this? Why does Hashem say that the kisser's children are going to be defeated by the cleaver's children? We, we, we will repeat over and over and over again that Orpah's kiss was deep and meaningful and really loving. So like I said in the beginning, we know that most stories in the Tanakh 
focus on if you fo when we when we learn this as kids or when you're reading something we weren't we, we learn it on the simple surface level we read the story of Rus it's a very beautiful story we read the story but if we delve into it deeper which is what the Tanakh does it we see here that you're able to find these endless patterns focusing on the psychology and the profound psychology of the human psyche of all of us for today. So what is the story behind the story? So now we're in Orpah's shoes. Orpah knew Jewish culture. She lived with Naomi in her home. She was imbued with the love and beauty of Judaism. She felt it in her core. So her tears when she was leaving Naomi, they were real. And the 40 steps that she experienced, you know, sometimes we um, we go through something and it it's five minutes. The experience was five minutes. And because it was so difficult, it felt like five hours or even five years. These 40 steps that she took were not 40 steps to like, oh my goodness, I need to go get myself a drink right now. I'm going to walk 40 steps to the kitchen. They weren't flippant steps. What were these 40 steps? When she was taking these 40 steps, she was fighting with herself. She had extreme conflict with herself. On the one hand, she was imbued with the beauty of authentic connection to Hashem, of dedication, of truth and kindness, of like the, the aura that emanated from Naomi was penetrated into her soul, penetrated into anyone who came into contact with her. So on the one hand, she had Hashem and beauty and authenticity and clear directives of how to live a life. And then on the other side, she had this pagan life. The, the, the Moabites at that time were living a life of complete paganism. The kings had all the power and they lived with the motto of do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, with whomever you want. Complete what it seems like, complete freedom, complete autonomy. And that is that was what she was doing. Should I go back to Moab? Should I stay with Ruth? Should I go back to Moab? Should I stay with Ruth? And ultimately she decides to go back to Moab. But when she gives that kiss, it's not a kiss of goodbye. It's a kiss of I'm I love you. Every time I think of you, I'm going to get emotional. I'm going to cry, but I can't stay in this life. I'm going to go to the other one. But she continues with that push and the pull. She was attracted to the world of Moab. They had these magnificent parties. They, they, they lived in the lap of luxury, similar to how we are today. We all love materialism. We love to live in this physical world and enjoy as much as we can food, anything that you can think of. They had zero moral inhibitions. They were allowed to do everything. There were zero boundaries. And there's something that's very appealing to that. Like I could wake up in the morning and just do whatever I want. Well, that sounds amazing, right? So this is what happens. When the kiss, when she was giving her that kiss, it wasn't just a kiss of I'm gonna miss you and I love you, but I can't stay here. It was a kiss of all the emotion that was going on inside of her, of this back and forth. Should I go? Should I stay? Should I go with her? Should I stay with her? And all of that anxiety that she had was coming out in that kiss. What I'm up to? Okay. So it says that she had ambivalence. And when we have ambivalence, as many of us know, when we know what we're doing or we know what we're not doing, we feel at peace. Like I'm doing this and I'm not doing this. I have peace because I know exactly where I'm at and what I'm doing. When we're ambivalent, when we're incongruent, that is when we struggle. Now there is no word in the Hebrew language for ambivalence. So in the Torah, there's a few, a few, I think four times where it says that people were experiencing ambivalence. I'm sorry, give me one second. I'm gonna throw him out. Very sorry about that. One of our guests came and Rocky doesn't know him. So 
we're going back to the ambivalence. So there was another time where there was ambivalence and we'll bring back the story of Lot. So Lot was the nephew of Avraham and they worked the pastures together. They were shepherds together. And at some point Lot decided, this is not what I want. I want to live my life. I want to be rich. I want to be powerful. I want to be successful. And he leaves Avraham and he takes all of his cattle and his wife and his children with him. And he moves to Sodom and he works his way up and he becomes a powerful person in Sodom. He's a leader. He has amassed great wealth. People come to him for advice and he's flying high. At one point, their two guests come to Sodom and Sodom is famous, or I should say infamous for not hosting. There was no kindness. There was like said to be not even when, Hashem, when Abraham asked Hashem to please save Sodom, when he said that he was going to destroy it, he went 50 people, even if there's 40 people, even if there's 10 good people, and there just wasn't. So what they would say is when you had guests, if you dared to have guests, they would put a guest on a bed. If they were too tall for the bed, they would chop off their feet. If they were too short for the bed, they would stretch their bodies. So these were not good people. Lot decides one day, he's still, at the end of the day, he's still Abraham's nephew. He was still raised to be kind and compassionate. And there's two people come into the city and he takes them into their his home. And the people who love him and looked up to him, whatever, comes banging at his door, let the guests out. We are going to hang them. We're going to torture them. And he says, no, I'm not going to let the guests out. I have the guests. I'm I, he so much so was in that mitzvah of Hachnasim that he, in a sickening way, offered his daughters to go out instead. And he does not let the guests come out. And he becomes an ostracized man. And they look at him like he's like back to you're a filthy, dirty Jew, same as in the times in in Germany in the Holocaust, where the where we were at the top of our game, the Jewish people. We were poets and laureates and, and artists and, and composers and people in politics. And did it matter to Hitler? At the end of the day, you were any part of you had any blood of a Jew inside of you and you were considered a filthy Jew. So they went from the ranks up here to down here. So what happens with Lot? The angels come to him and they say, God is going to destroy Sodom. You need to leave. And there it says that Lot also had ambivalence because he had lived with Avraham. He knew that life and that's not what he wanted. He wanted this physical materialistic world. And then he saw his life come crumbling down and crashing into nothing, but he vacillated. He was going like, and how it sounds in the Torah when they read it is, ah, I don't have a good voice, but you get the point. And it's the, the, the notation, it is like a zigzag. Like they're being pulled in two different directions. So that's what was happening with Orpa. Orpa is known as the mother of ambivalence. She chooses Moab. She chooses Moab. She chooses materialism. She chooses physicality. But after having lived with Naomi for so long, can she wholeheartedly choose that life and not have turmoil inside of her of something that's craving something else? So... She's forever yearning for that connection that she had when she was with Naomi. So her whole life, she's living in ambivalence. Her whole life is back and forth, back and forth. And even though the materialism there was darkened by the ugliness of their behavior, that was the culture there. And she accepted that culture. So when it says that Orpa slept with 100 men, the night after she left um, Naomi, what does that tell us about her? What do you, what do you, when you think of a woman who goes and sleeps with a hundred men in one night, do you say she's a disgusting human being? Like even, even women who are promiscuous, they're promiscuous, like even the biggest gangsters, two, three, a hundred. When, when I hear that someone does something like that, to me, it's like, that woman is suffering. That woman is in terrible, horrific pain. So what was her, what was her pain? 
her pain was this ambivalence. She's living this life of physicality and materialism. And yet her soul is yearning for that. So what we, and she couldn't numb herself. She couldn't numb that emotion that was stirring inside of her. She had just left Naomi and she needed something to take away the pain that she was feeling of giving up that life and being back and forth and back and forth. So she didn't have an iPhone. She couldn't go shopping. She couldn't get up. She had nothing to numb her. So, okay, try numbing yourself with one, two, three, a hundred. We have to understand the depths of her pain. So I, um, I heard from Rabbi Abraham Tversky. Um, he was very much in, he started the first 12 step program for Jewish people. And he was very much in the addiction recovery world. And he said of the addict's neshama, he said, we all go through difficulty and challenge in life, but some people, they can just gloss over it. An addict, one who has this deeper spiritual, more real connection, they can't just gloss things over. Everything hits them harder than it does other people. And so they have to anesthetize and go find other things. And this is exactly what Naomi was doing. She needed to be extreme to shut out the noise of what she had left behind. So, and we all know, I don't know if we all know, but I'm I'm big believer in this, is so so Arpa lived a life of ambivalence. Arpa lived a life of back and forth of turmoil. And she never resolved her issues. She never worked through her issues. She never fully made the cut and said, I'm leaving that and I'm living in Moab and I'm going to live this life fully or I'm leaving Moab and I'm going to be with Rus fully. She continued that life of the back and forth, which was torture for her. So what happens when we don't deal with our issues? We hand them down to our children. We hand them down to our grandchildren. Um, some people refer to it as generational trauma. So what happens? I have a basketball that was handed to me by my parents, and I'm going to hand that basketball down to my children. Some people will even refer to this as tradition or in the Hebrew word, misora. But when you connect tradition with unhealthiness or the need to suppress our emotions and we label it as tra tra tradition, that is not the healthy part of tradition because tradition is full of love. Tradition is about connection. But when we connect other things to that, it changes what the tradition is. So we have a choice. We have a choice today, us. And it says that Hashem created us. He had the angels. They were perfect. They did his bidding. He didn't even have to request. They had no choice. That's how they were created. And Hashem wasn't happy. He wanted to create a people who could choose to serve him. So, sorry, train of thought. So what we can do is instead of taking that baseball or that basketball or that baggage that we have, and this is in no way a critique of the generations before us handing this down. Firstly, they were survivors of war. They were immigrants. Our ancestors didn't really have time to delve into their emotions. They didn't have time to think about whether or not they were satisfied or happy. They were busy surviving, but that was handed down to us, both the good and the bad generationally, but we have an option. We have choice. So we could take that ball and it's terrifying to not continue in the path that you've been used to forever and just keep going that way because it's been done that way for generations. So let me just keep going. We have a choice to take the unhealthy parts and change them and do something different. Delve into ourselves, listen to our bodies, listen to our neshama. You know, I was telling, I was teaching a class last week and I said, recently, I've never, ever had anxiety in my life. And the last couple of weeks, I wake up in the morning and I have a little anxiety. So I try to dissect it. Is it coming from my son being in the Israeli army? Is it coming from what's going on in here in our community right now? And yes, obviously that all factors in, but really like I, 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 I sat with myself and that's not what it was. What I came up with, what, what it was for me 
is my anxiety was my neshama speaking to me and telling me, this is what I need from you. I need you to be with me where I'm at. I need you to allow me to, to maximize and actualize the potential of why I was sent down here. So what we have to do ultimately is choose our values, our true values in life over our desires. And that's not an easy thing to do. And it's a, it's, it's a daily struggle. It's probably an hourly struggle. So now let's say you take Goliath and he's not living in the, he's not a Philistine. He's living in sunny Florida or sunny California. And this is what the Tanakh wants us to do. Take away the actual body of the character and let's take out the characteristics, the nuances of what they have to teach us. So if we put Gullios on a sofa in a therapist's office, <clears throat> the therapist would say he has anger management. He had all kinds of things that are going on and start diagnosing him with all different types of things. When, when really, when Gullios was cursing the Jewish people and intimidating him, what he was really doing was cursing himself because he lived in a home where Judaism may never have been spoken about, but it was very much alive. So when it says that he went morning and evening of the 40 days, yes, he knew that in Arpa's life, morning meant it's time to say Shema, and I'm not saying it. Night meant it's time to say Shema, and I'm not saying it. So looking at Arpa, he couldn't he couldn't live with the self-disgust that he had of himself, which was given to him from his mother, of being this back and forth. Who am I meant to be? Who am I not meant to be? So let's go back to Rus now. Rus's name. What's her name? Her name is Rus. Rus means saturated. So they give an explanation that her name was Rus because her grandson, David Amelech, saturated the world with the words of the Tehillim. So does that really make sense? Like, because her grandson was like literally a Nobel laureate, does that mean that that's why she got the honor of having her name? So, sorry, just one second. Now we know that this, just like Orpa, Ruth, Ruth was not a naive woman. She was smart, she understood the world, and she fully understood Orpa. She got it because she had that same temptation and that same desire. She also understood that it would make sense and it would be more comfortable and it would be maybe more fun, an immediate instant gratification to go back to Moab. But she made a choice and not because she didn't have a choice. She clearly had a choice. Her mother-in-law asked her to go. I, I don't want you to feel like you need to stay with me. And she made an active decision. And when we say that we make choice, it means that if we, in order to make choice, there have to be other options. And those other options were very, very real options for her. So what is the depth of Judaism? Is that we get to make choices. It's that we, we honor and respect our desires because they're real. Our desires are real. Our insecurities are real. They're here. We pay attention to them, but we don't allow ourselves to be controlled by them. We make an active choice that no, yes, all of these exciting things right here, I would really like to do, but I'm making a choice to be connected to God. I am making a choice to work on myself and to work on my issues so that I don't hand them down to the next generations. So it all boils down to going back to that it was in the kiss because if she left with a clean conviction, she would have been done. Naomi let her leave. She wasn't chasing her. Why did she have this ambivalence? Because it lived deep within her. What she didn't have, which is what Ruth had, is she didn't have the ability to say, I am going to choose. I am going to choose. God over all of this materialism. 
but says in the world, everybody knows the song and the whole world is a narrow bridge, Gesher Tzarmeod. The world that we live in is a narrow bridge. We walk a tightrope. Some days the tightrope is a little wider. Some days it's really, really just a tightrope. And it says that on either side of this Gesher of what we call life, on one side is fire, on the other side is ice. If I fall to the left, I'm burned. If I fall to the right, I'm frozen. Who do I want to be? Who do I want to be? Who do we want to be? So it's not we both, we all have both ARPA and Rus living within us. We have that push and that pull. The desire to go eat out and go to the movies and party and do all of these things. And then we have that deep desire that comes from our soul. And it reminds us, if we would just pay attention to it, that this is where we really want to be. So gratefully in Judaism, materialism is not shunned. We're not the aesthetic religions where we say you need to separate yourself from anything materialistic. God wants us to enjoy the materialistic part of the world, to elevate the materialism. So if I'm going out to have lunch with my friends, we elevate the meal by making blessings before we eat, sharing a word of Torah. Anything that we do in that physical world needs to have something spiritual that accompanies it to give it the power and the energy that it needs. So within the Rus and the, Vor and the Orpa that we both have within us, the struggle is real. Working on ourselves, not holding things in, not repressing, connecting is a work in progress. Every single day we have to make wake up and recommit to connecting to authenticity, to connecting to Hashem. And I, I've been teaching a lot the last couple of days, weeks, um, and I, I hear this a lot and I've said it a lot, but I don't feel it. I don't feel it or I'm not connecting. And I have completely worked that through for myself. There are things that I don't feel or I don't connect with. We can't connect with everything. When the Jewish people, Hashem offered the Torah to a lot of different nations. When he offered it to the Jewish people, they said, Nasa Benishma, we will accept. We are taking this on. And then Nishma, we're going to spend the rest of our lives trying to understand. But we accept means that there is a higher power. There is Hashem over there who is guiding us in the right way to live. So if you don't feel it, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Um, when, when you keep doing something, behavior makes nature. You do it over and over and over again, like muscle memory in your body. You go to the gym, it remembers. And when I want to connect to a friend of mine, do I sit in my house and say, oh my God, I feel so disconnected from my friend. Why am I not connected? No, I pick up the phone and I call her and I make an effort to connect. So it's very <clears throat> easy to say, I don't feel connected to Hashem. It doesn't feel good to feel that, but reach out, reach out to Hashem and connect with him and you will start to feel the connection. And I want to bless everyone that I'm not going to say that we have no challenge in life because life is made up of challenge and the challenge that we experience inevitably, if we work through it in the, in a healthy way and with support, with friends, with family, the challenge brings us to a better, stronger, healthier place. Did I zoom out? Somebody's screen sharing. If you could please stop screen sharing. Thanks. So I, I yeah, I just do want to say this about David HaMelech and Tehillim. So when I was younger, I used to tell my father when he would tell me to, to pray to Davin, I would say, like, it doesn't mean anything to me. Like, I, it doesn't mean anything to me. So he said to me, why don't you Davin in English? So um, this past couple of weeks that we're all saying to Hillim for this very special little boy, Rafael Jaime Erben Sima Chasha, um, I am reading to Hillim in English. And when you read the to Hillim in English, you see, we think of David HaMelech, King David. He 
managed to destroy Galias. We know about the story of David and Bacheva. We think of him as like in this beautiful romantic terms. But when you read the Tehillim, every single chapter of Tehillim is laced with pain. Um, in the later parts of his life, he spent the, the chunk of his life doing teshuva for what he did with Bacheva. It's a story of pain and suffering. And yet in his pain and suffering, different than any other of the Jewish kings, some of the other kings, when they would, when they sinned and a Navi would come and tell them, they, they tried to explain their way out of it. When the Navi came and told David that what he did with Bacheva was incorrect with her husband, he immediately, immediately owned what he did immediately. And from then forward did Shuva for the rest of his life. He was tortured by his, his siblings his children, his everyone, his father, his father-in-law, everyone wanted to kill this man. And yet he is completely connected to Hashem and never loses faith. So when we read the Tehillim, I would suggest sometimes reading in English so you feel the full impact of what you're actually saying. And we are all praying, demanding, and hoping for a miracle for this little boy but I, I do want to say this, sometimes the miracles that Hashem does are, don't seem like miracles to the human eye, to the human heart, to the human psyche. But when we understand the Pasuk where it says, and there's the simple meaning, which is what I think the majority of people go with, think good and it will be good. I'm going to manifest positive energy and then things will be better. And that's a very nice thing. And it's really true. We can manifest positive energy. But really what the, I believe it was the Free Dicker Rebbe said, what, what he really meant when he said, Trach good, but sein good, was think good and it will be good, is that everything that Hashem does is good. The things that we understand and the things that we don't understand. And when we're connecting to Hashem, when we're, in a relationship with Hashem, like when we're in a relationship with a fellow human, we can be happy with them, we can be upset with them, we can love them, we can hate them. When you're in a relationship with Hashem, you can have those conversations, you can demand from Him, but not always is the answer the one that we want. Like I know sometimes my kids will say to me, they'll ask me something, and I answer them like, Ma, you didn't answer me, you didn't answer me. And I was like, I answered you. You just didn't like the answer. You didn't like the answer. So sometimes we don't like Hashem's answer. And we are sitting here all over the world. The amount of positive resolutions and actual real significant change that people are making in their lives is awe-inspiring, incredible to witness. It's happening right here in our community because the little boy is from here. So it, it, we feel it very strongly here. And it's it's like a revival of Judaism in the most productive, beautiful, positive way. And the people who are taking on positive res resolutions are not making it conditional. It's an unconditional resolution that they're taking things on in the merits of this little boy waking up, but they are going to continue these mitzvahs forever regardless, which to me is absolutely incredible. I mean, the things that people are taking on and the outpouring of love and the children, the women, the men, everyone. So thank you to everyone who um, is participating in that. If you aren't, I know that um, the Lababa Chereba would say at night before he went to bed, I'm going to do one thing more or one thing better than I did today. And if someone as righteous as the Rebbe can say that, then we definitely have space where we can say that to do one thing more or one thing better. And it doesn't have to be a huge commitment. It doesn't have to be something extremely life-changing. It could be small little things because every small little thing adds up. And when you do that little thing, you always want to do a little bit more because you're feeding your neshama and it gets greedy. It wants more. It doesn't want one little bite. It wants the whole meal. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Devorah Leah, so much for sharing with us your wisdom. And um, Hashem should continue to bless you with revealed blessings in your life. We're going to...
uh, share a beautiful video. It is, it is a few more minutes than it usually is, but it's amazing uh, about about Shavuos. So please, if you're able to stay on, I recommend. And I would just like to say that it's the year of Hakel, and the year of Hakel, the Jews every seven years, sorry, every eight years, the Jewish people um, would gather and they they used to come and bring sacrifices to Hashem and the men, women, and children um, would come and it would be a connection and beautiful. Today, we don't have the base of Mikdash with us that we can see, but we can create the base of Mikdash in our own, in our own homes and in our own lives and in our own families and in our own, in our own social settings. And um, it's right now we're doing a hakel. We had tonight 74 ladies join live on this class. And I'm hopeful and I'm hoping that people are not just going to come on and to hear this amazing history story that Devorah Leah shared. It's wonderful, but what are we going to take from it? And there's so many points. So I hope, I hope um, you'll take something from it and take on new resolutions um, going forward. And I'm looking forward to continue the hot goals every Wednesday. Please join us if you want to join, reach out to me and I will connect you with classes. We also have a YouTube channel, so please subscribe. I would like to say thank you to all the ambassadors of the class that share. I wanna say thank you to everyone that joins weekly live, everyone that joins after the class to listen in. And I would like to say um, thank you very much to Shandy Jacobson for always just being a listening ear to the class and really help guide me to make this class a reality. So thank you so, so much. Um, thank you to Joelle for helping out with the flyers whenever she's able to. And really thank you to Hashem and the Rebbe for making this happen. Um, I'm gonna share with you a little late, later what I, the Yom Yom says about action and making things happen. But at the end of the day, we can have everything, we can have the ideas, but if we don't have Hashem in our life and Hashem's blessing, it's not gonna come into fruitation. And this class is definitely um, has Hashem's blessings and the Rebbe's blessings from above because every week um, the same people keep coming back. New people want to join in. Everyone wants a piece of this class. And it's because it's real and it's amazing and it's authentic. And we have the most amazing guest speakers that come on. So thank you to everyone who has been part of this amazing shluchas of bringing more light into the world. So Give me one moment while I pull up the screen. And I'm just going to ask everyone if they can please stay muted. One second. The Yem Shavuiz, so be shown as Zu, sein ongefilled, all the botic nisis, be shas kris a tere von a seres a dibris, mit kinder sei ingelach und sei medelach und sicher, wenn sie nicht mehr wabel sein zu kris a tere wer aderabe. Sie will noch verstarten, dem ihre Sachen und ihre Satelle, bis wann es beloschen hat, ihr du, Marla Hallon, Beemel, Beiro, Uberesses und Besio, ist Afghan. In Tafshin Mem, the Rebbe came out with a campaign that all children should come for the Aseret Sadibris. Me ben Shalomayla from 30 days and up. Just like it was by the Maimed of Harsinai, by the, the day of the revelation at, at Harsinai with the giving of the Torah. So the Rebbe wanted a big campaign. We did ads in the newspaper. I remember writing up the ad, and the ad said, Ten Commandments coming soon to a synagogue near you. We prepared a, a contest children would go to shul with their parents, they would write in, their names would be put in a raffle. We made a 
poster. We got David Berg to illustrate the poster. So he drew a synagogue where people are receiving the Ten Commandments on Shavuos. Now we also had a truck with, which had uh, letters on it. It wasn't so common then. And the Rebbe came out of his office very late. It must have been like 2 in the morning. But we wanted the Rebbe to see the, the mobile unit that had about instructions of coming to the, to the Ten Commandments, to come to the synagogue, children, being your parents. And sure enough, the Rebbe, the light went off in the Rebbe's room, and the Rebbe came out. <laughs> the Rebbe was smiling, he was looking, and he, he stopped, and he was reading the entire wording of the... And the Rebbe gave an inspirational emotion to the Bochim, and we were elated that the Rebbe was very proud of the way we were executing this campaign. We came for Shavuos to New York with our four-month-old baby. There was never such a marble. That morning, an hour before, before Kriyasatere, it, it was like the Sutton tribe. There was a river on Kingston Avenue. The cars couldn't even drive. And all you could see on Kingston Avenue were young parents with carriages covered with garbage bags running, running in the rain. It rained buckets. It was a very, very strong, unusually strong rain. My daughter turned 30 days on Hay 7 the day before, and uh, we bundled up the baby, put her into a carriage, covered it up with whatever protection it has, and um, we brought it to 770. <laughs> And we decided this is the Rebbe's Mifsa, she's 30 days old, she has to be there. I went all the way up front near where the Rebbe was standing, because my father would stand there, and I was holding the, the baby, and uh, the Rebbe had a lot of nachos roch with a smile. So over the years, in the Chabad houses, they started the cheesecake parties and a lot of places they have the Torah reading separate later in the afternoon. Having these type of programs of Kriyasatari later in the afternoon and cheesecake parties uh, definitely introduced Shvuas to many kids. I will not 
of bringing together Yiddish kinder, Malda Yiddish kinder. So the key for Nasseris Adib is Betsibo, the way of Am Hadras Mela. Shavuos is like the most underrated Jewish holiday. People never heard of Shavuos. And this definitely made headway and, and uh, brought tremendous results. This production is made possible through the generosity of the members of the GEM Foundation. In dem Yontif climb sag doch alle jüdische Schommes und alle jeden befragt, auf zu hören, kriegt er Tere der Seres Adibres, Punkt, wie sie gewähnt, dem ersten Mal bei Martin Tere. Er sagt, der ganze jüdische Volk und alle Schommes von allen Dälis, Gehört der Seres Adibris von den Ebersten Alleen, als er ist der noch jeder Jahr in Sman Martin Taylor Seno, wenn wir leben in der Heiligen Taylor, der Seres Adibris, darf man sich vorstellen, warum er steht in der Taylor, an der was leben die Taylor, der Seres Adibris. Tut er das mit dem Kehrch und als Aschliach von den Ebersten, gedeht so noch einmal und bei Neuen, mit einer neuen Starkheit und mit einer neuen Lebendigkeit und mit einer neuen Lichtigkeit, dem Herrn und dem Aufnehmen von der Allah Seres Adibris und dann noch mitnehmen, die Starkheit und Kehr und Lichtigkeit auf jeder Jahr von dem ganzen Jahr. Wo da sie doch speziell ungesagt geworden, die jüdische Kinder, wo sie seine der Gewände erleben, wo es bis Husso von sehr Orwes durch den Zusatz, als jüdische Kinder werden sich aufheben, wie sie steht in der Aceres Adibris und in der Tele, wo es kommt, der noch und fährt der Aceres Adibris in dem Schuss oder eben gelebt als sicher, wer sich jeder jüdische Kind und alle jüdischen Kinder als sie aufhören und hat der Fall gesagt, der Aceres Adibris und gegeben, der ganze Tele, zum jüdischen Volk und zu jeder Iden bis safe kol hadelis. Und dort geht der Kirche dem Kehr auf Einwirken, auf sich noch mehr in Melchome haben, um in Azea sein dem Jezer und an Rest helfen, an Ingele alle Ingele herum sich und an Mädele alle Mädele herum sich. Und nicht beten die Eltern, als sie so einen Ton noch mehr in Befüche und in Wolfgang lassen sie, bis wann ist das heute eine Wirkung auf der ganzen Welt, als in der Welt soll sein, nicht der Mäbischen des Bruches, wo sie sich beschaffen die ganze Welt, wie der Tester gesagt, Brech ist Bruder, der Kim ist ein Schamai und ein Soritz. Und auf all die, was wir gefunden haben, noch in Golos. Was der Maschich ist auch noch der Weile nicht gekommen, kommen doch Fragen, mit was für ein Kehr wird man überkommen, dem Golos, und zugereiten sich auf Aufnehmen Maschich nahe, ist auf der Ebenzeit gleich schon in der Serie Sadibris, ist gleich der Ronnips an der Ebenzeit sorgt zu jeder Rieden und zu jeder Kind, 
und speziell zu den Kindern von Zivis Hashem. A jeder von euch soll wissen, als er nicht sich auf Hashem in der Kirche, a der Ebester sagt auf sich, als er ist der dein Gott und dein Starkheit, und Hashem hat sich auf mich erst mit Zweien, was ich auf dir allein Riss genommen von einem Golus, von Eretz Mitzrayim. Wie der Töchter gesagt, Achai wodem Liris Atzmei, Kilo Hayim, Jotzom in Mitzrayim, der Monten das gleich in den Monats von Aseris Adibris, wo das gießer der Sicherheit, als wie bald am geht mit dem Kommandier in Schief, mit Nebesten allein, wo es hat ein Teil ist genommen, Jotze Hayemi mit Zreien, ist doch sicher, als er wird ich ein Teil ist nehmen, jeder von euch und jeder von uns und dem ganzen jüdischen Volk, von dem istrigen Golus, und es wird sein Moschiach nahe und mit gehen alle zusammen, Me kabo zayn p'mishi p'nei m'shiach z'itkeinu u metem tzuzamin gein in Eretz ha-Kedesh u dort n'in Yerushalayi m'ira Kedesh u dort n'in gufi in den beis ha-Migdosh Wow, thanks for staying on. I hope you enjoyed that video as much as I did. Um, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. So thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna have a Farbringen, um, a Hasidic gathering. So it says that what Malach Michal can do, we can do. And we are a beautiful um, 52 ladies still on. So if everyone can cope, go get your choice of beverage. My choice tonight is I'm going to have a little bit uh, of a lachayim. This is something that I was told the Rebetzin Chaim Mushka, the Rebbe's wife, would have a drink from, and it's delicious. It's an orange liqueur. So I'm going to have a little bit, not as much as last time. I'm going to just say lachayim before we end this class so we can all say I'm made for those that have to leave. But we are doing this in honor, this for bringing in honor of the complete Rafoa Shalema of Rafal Chaim Mayer, Ben Sima Chasha. May we hear revealed miracles. It can happen. It will happen. And we can make it happen by doing good deeds and having good thoughts and um, good resolutions. We can make it happen. Our class did it in the path for Miriam Bas Ina Pethi Yocheved, a girl in a car accident who's my dear friend just called me earlier today. And she told me she's getting a job very soon. She's starting. It's a miracle. The doctors pronounced her that if she lives, she's going to be a vegetable. A car, um, a drunk driver uh, smashed into her car while she was driving her daughter and her friends. Unfortunately, one of special souls left this world and her neshama should have an aliyah and we're also doing this so anything can happen our class showed up we made sure to always be there for her and learn and daven and really really pray to hashem that she should have her miracle and she did so i'm going to beg everyone here to do the same as you did for her so we can get uh, very soon the good news for Rafael Chaim Meir Ben Sima Chasha that the whole world is desperately davening for and for all Kali Yisrael anybody who needs you should merit the miracle as well I would also like to just say that Fabringen is going to be an honor of a very very special neshama and person Sima Bas Mordechai HaKohen may her neshama have the highest aliyah I'm going to make a, bless a blessing if everyone could say amen the blessings at the bottom. So I'm going to stop the recording.